Okay, um, so there's going to be a couple of things. I first got to go a little, little bit of theory uh, about how airfo airfoils are designed or what sort of design parameters they have. So a couple of important notes. Um, in X-Plane, uh, so let's open up an aircraft in, in Plane Maker. I'm going to talk a little bit about what the difference is between the blade element model and the the sort of the airfoil model in X-Plane because there's a bit of a split there. A lot of people think that X-Plane is a super duper accurate aerodynamic simulation and it's just everything you sort of get for free and the reality unfortunately is not like that. Um, so for X-Plane the way it works is X-Plane um, exposes it, it, it contains two sort of aerodynamic models, or, well, not two aerodynamic models, but basically it treats the fuselage as one and uh, as one piece, and then the wings as a separate piece. Oh, uh, god damn it. It's trying to load um, a big plane here, so it's taking a while. Um, come on. Airfoil maker is taking forever, or plane maker actually. There we go. So let's open up something that's a little bit simpler than the Challenger. Although I can demonstrate it on the Challenger actually, so who cares? Um, Challenger is going to work fine. Come on. Close you, and we're going to go into invisible parts. We're going to show all parts and not the 3D model in plane maker so a lot of people think that um x-plane does the aerodynamic computations on the whole thing here but and the reality of it is it's it's not trivially true um x-plane does aerodynamic modeling on the body on all the what I, what plane maker calls bodies so that'd be you know things like the fuselage engine nacelles and any kind of like sort of exposed pieces that you design over here in the fuselage model and the miscellaneous bodies models um, and then of course we also have the engine nacelles models and blah 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 so that's basically what X-Plane does the bulk of its blade element modeling on um, and um, over that you basically have no direct control it's basically you trying to find the shape of the aircraft as close as possible by the way, you don't have to necessarily join things up or do thing, do complicated things like wing boxes. Explain kind of sort of doesn't really care about that all that closely. So there is some leeway, so there's, there's just some amount of sort of wiggle room. And then we're talking about primarily the wings and sort of stabilizers and that kind of stuff. Um, so funny story is the model you see in here in Playmaker for the wings and you know the, the stabilizers is entirely irrelevant essentially to the aerodynamics to a degree it is to to degree it isn't but essentially it's largely irrelevant um uh, you, you just want to make sure that you've got the rough dimensions correctly so that x-plane can estimate um certain things and then um primarily so so, so the uh, let me respecify this um playmaker doesn't really care about things like the exact shape of the airfoil so if you look at the airfoil cross section here, um, this thing basically does not matter to Plane Maker or rather X Plane's aerodynamics. The, the exact sort of shape here, you can see it's kind of rough anyway, so it's it's not really. Yeah, I'm kind of down in it, Delta. Who? But we'll see. Uh, perhaps. Uh, so X Plane do really does not care all that much about the wing shape. What it cares about. Primarily is things like wingspan, um, how much of the surfaces here are uh, are actually moving parts, like you know flight controls and that kind of stuff. It does care about that, and uh, it cares about the length of the wings. So basically, this dimension over here, so span and length, to a degree also the uh, the the wing sweep, but um, to a lesser, somewhat lesser degree. So. Um, but what defines the primary um, sort of behavior characteristics of an airfoil is a bunch of parameters that are not directly visible in here. And for that purpose, I'm gonna hide this. What it primarily defines, what are what the parameters are that primarily defines an airfoil 
behavior for X-Plane is the thing that you select when you go up here into Expert, Airfoils, you select Wings, and here you select uh, which airfoils you want X-Plane to apply. Now what airfoils in X-Plane define is a fairly simple thing. Uh, they define three parameters for X-Plane to look at. Uh, the parameters are the green thing is the coefficient of lift, the yellow thing is the coefficient of moment, and the red thing is coefficient of drag. <clears throat> so what do these mean? Um, if we look uh, at the definitions here, now this is all kind of scary math, but we're, we generally do not care about all that. Um, lift as a force is what we want to see. So what the definition is, uh, not quite, a little bit, uh, lift coefficient, there we go, there we go, that's the equation we are looking for. Um, so this is primarily what defines, L is the total lift of the wing, right, so X-plane um, knows the sort of shape of the wing, so it understands um, it understands that, for instance, when the wing is sort of bent upwards, if you have a bunch of a bunch of dihedral in it, so the thing basically slopes up like that, it knows that the lift, so a little bit more sequentially. When X-Plane examines the behavior of a wing, it uh, understands that it basically chops up the wing into separate pieces along the span of the wing. And the span of the wing is basically the thing that goes out in this direction, away from the fuselage. The X-Plane chops it up into pieces, typically around 10 to 20 pieces. Um, and for each of the pieces, it, derives, it sort of models the thing as one big chunk. Um, it, it, it largely ignores things like, you know, the exact shape. And so let's consider, for example, right here at the wing root, um, X-Plane uh, understands that, okay, we have this length of wing here. The relative wind speed hitting the wing is such and such, the angle of attack is such and such, all that, those kinds of parameters, and that then gets fed into essentially X-Plane does this kind of a computation, right? So it knows the uh, rho is just density of the air, V is velocity squared, or V squared is velocity squared of the air coming in, S is the characteristic surface area. Now the characteristic surface area for a piece of the wing would be what X-Plane sort of chops up the wing into sections and it knows, okay, the average length of the wing is here. I know the width of the piece that I've chopped up. So it calculates the surface area of the wing. And CL is what you get here in Airfoil Maker. So, and the, airfoil, and the way this is defined is for an airfoil, you define this X-axis is the angle of attack of the airfoil, right? So the more the more the aircraft is sort of pitched up relative to the oncoming air, the higher you are to the right. So the further off to the right you are. Here's the zero point, so this is alpha zero. And you can actually watch this over here. Alpha is the angle of attack. And then we have the three parameters that are being read out. So for alpha zero, this wing right here that we have just created, some sort of untitled generic wing, basically the default one that you create when you get do nothing, has a coefficient of lift of 0.25. Yeah, actually, I'm going to try and show you um, without moving the cursor right here. So here we have 0 0.25 and at an, alpha, at an angle of attack of, of, of 0 degrees. So that means if the wing is sort of flying um, directly flat onto the air, assuming that basically we completely flat with the fuselage, then its lift generated would be described by... Um, well, one half, uh, so, so one half density of the air times the velocity times the surface area times 0 0.25. That'd be the total lift force, the, the force lifting the wing up at that piece um, at this sort of speed. So, so with me, everybody with me so far? This should be relatively straightforward to understand. If there's any questions, by the way, feel free to stop me. Anyway, let's let's sort of move on. So, 
if nobody's got questions, we'll move on. Everybody's probably fairly familiar. What do you mean, uh, Sim Caesar? There's literally just multiplication in here. One half times density times velocity squared times surface times coefficient of lift. But the thing is, you don't have to calculate this. All you have to understand, all, all the airfoil defines is this CL piece here. All we care about is right here at the end. That's what the airfoil defines with this green line. So the higher the angle of attack of the wing, the greater the lift coefficient. Basically, the more lift the wing is capable of generating. Now, the other parameters are a little bit more difficult to understand. Um, so the red one is still pretty straightforward. That's the coefficient of drag. Because the wing, and i got to pull up uh, my little GIMP instance here, and we'll make an image here. And let's go for a brush, uh, size, something like that, <coughs> and a, <coughs> a color that you guys are going to be able to see. <coughs> okay, so the coefficient of the lift, so let's, let's paint some sort of a generic wing on here. Uh, uh, or whatever. That'll work. That'll do. Um... So the coefficient of lift defines how much upward force is being generated by the wing, right? So we have um, some sort of, so by the way, the points I'm going to call, you know, for those that are not very familiar with, with the way things are named in, in, on wings, this here would be the, um, this point here is called the leading edge. Uh, leading edge and obviously um, the guy in chat knows what that means here we have the trailing edge trailing edge <clears throat> now then we have a line here that connects the leading edge and the trailing edge <laughs> This line, that is directly, it's a straight line called the chord line. The chord line di directly connects as a straight shot from the leading to the trailing edge. Then there's another line usually described that instead of doing a straight shot across, does follow the sort of center of the thickness of the wing. So this piece here. It, there would be an equal distance between that and that. So if, say for instance, I had a very sort of um, oblong airfoil that looked like that, the cord line would be going from, this would be the cord line, and the camber line would look something like this. So this would be called, so this is called the camber, camber line. And the other thing was the cord line. <clears throat> so the the way X plane basically defines point, or the the, the way X plane defines. Um, let's get actually let's make a new picture here because that this one's getting kind of cluttered. Mm -mm -mm. I'm going to make it somewhat nicer. Um, yeah, I said somewhat nicer. Cool. So we here we have some sort of a wing. Not a very good, good wing, but who cares? For airfoil. Um, so the next plane talks about anything that has to do with angle of attack. So here's the leading edge, here's a trailing edge, and a cord line here. Um, I'm gonna use a different sort of size, maybe a color change. Um, I want, please, some sort of, a, I don't know, cyan color or something. Um, so this would be our, you're not gonna be able to see that on stream. Um, there we go, that'll work. I'll make it 
thicker. But here's the cord line. The oncoming air, which in science terms is called the free stream, um, it makes an angle here. So let's say that we have air coming directly sort of, sort of in that kind of direction, right? So the angle that is formed by the oncoming air with the cord line here, this angle we call alpha. That's the angle of attack. Positive up, um, negative down. The more a wing generates lift, we say that its coefficient of the lift is going up. It's increasing. So in this direction, we have the coefficient of the lift, CL. The wing at the same time also generates another force, its resistance force to movement through the air, which is parallel along the cord line. And that is described by the coefficient of drag. It uses the, the, the coefficient of drag uses essentially the same uh, the same notation. So let's say force of lift is one half. Uh, what is the symbol again? I keep forgetting what the symbol for rho is. There it is. <laughs> um, rho V squared S C L. This is our for force for lift. So that would be force of lift. Force of drag would be essentially the same thing. One half rho V squared surface area times the coefficient of drag. What these really are is they tell you... Um, what they tell you is, depending on the on these pieces that are basically the same, you know, for a given flight state, density of the air, speed of flight, and surface area of the wing, they tell you the relationship between lift and drag, the, the ratio between these two, essentially. How good the wing is at generating lift, this direction, which we want, versus how good Good, how bad it is at generating excess drag, which which is usually what we don't want on, on a wing. Um, so, there's another thing in there. You'll notice that there's a third parameter here, which is yellow, called the coefficient of moment. Now that is a bit of a complicated matter <laughs> to explain, but basically what it tells you... Um, what it tells you is... If along the wing, I chop up the wing here into half and again into half. All right, so here we have a point which is called the 25% cord point, one quarter of the cord along the cord. I can mo so the wing, the air not only causes the wing to go want to go that way, not only causes the wing to want to go that way, it also generates a twisting force. So the wing will either want to go twist like that. Or the wing will gonna will want to try and twist like that. It basically wants to twist the wing around, right? Because for example, if you have uh, the, the wing is not a symmetrical shape, so it, it naturally will want to turn one way or the other. What the coefficient of moment says essentially is how far away. Uh, well, it's a little bit more difficult than, to explain than that, but basically what it says: if I p put a pivot along the wing here at the 25% cord line. How much force would I experience to make the wanna make the make the wing wanna twist upwards? So what that basically means, if if I see a negative twist, a negative value for the coefficient of a moment, so we have a CM of 0 0.04, that means that the wing wants to ever so slightly twist down like that. It wants to go tra leading edge down trailing edge up a little bit. The higher the value, basically, the more of a twisting force the air generates for the same sort of set of parameters here, for this set of parameters, um, the more twisting force the air wants to generate. And naturally, as you can imagine, all of this is indexed by the angle of attack. So the wing has different behaviors. It wants to twist in different ways, depending on whether the air is coming on from here or perhaps from here or perhaps like that, or like that. So the, the angle, sort of, so to speak. I'm not talking about, you know, the air is only literally just coming through a single stream like that. No, the air is all coming in this direction. Yeah. The air is completely... I'm talking about the angle here. 
make sense so far for everybody? If there's any questions, do let me know. So that's what our airfoil file defines here. And you'll find two tabs here, AOA 20 and AOA 180. Um, AOA, the only difference is the scale of the graph. Um, AOA 20 goes from zero here in the center to plus 20 and negative 20 angle of attack, whereas the extended version goes from zero to plus 180, negative 180, basically a full spin of the wing. Now do super critical airfoils. Yeah, I'm not going to do that. Uh, there's a bunch of other tabs here. Uh, by the way, the section tab here is purely for graphical purposes. Um, it's basically just a sort of thing that you define for how the wing is going to look like to in Plane Maker um, and essentially nothing else. So you can basically make this look like whatever the hell you want. x is not really going to use this for aerodynamic compute computations. You sort of just roughly estimate, you know, my wing's going to look blah, whatever, something like this. Who cares? Um, okay. Wing LD um, is just a sort of analysis tool that lets you see in the, the sort of purple color here. That is your lift to drag ratio. Basically, if you take, uh, if you took the green thing here and the red thing here and you divide red, green by red, what certain number do you get? And so that's that purple thing here. So that's how you determine, for example, where your wing is most efficient, where it generates the most amount of lift or the least amount of drag. Um, and so that for this wing here would be at alpha 2.1, roughly thereabouts. Surface area, the whole surface area, the chunk of the airfoil. No, only, only the chunk. Yes, Magus, I, I understand what you mean. It's only the piece that X-Plane is examining because X-Plane examines wings in chunks. It chunks it up along the span here into approximately 20 pieces. And uh, so for, say for instance, between these two here lines, it would take these two pieces together, calculate the area, and just use that sort of as a center, as a sort of, uh, hey, leading edge, have a good one. See you, Gordon. And then it basically does it for each piece, one piece at a time. Now, the crucial thing to understand here, yes, the whole area, it basically um, does an average, right? Um, so it knows, okay, so if I take the wing from here to here and did it like a square, then the area is too large. If I came from here to here, it's too small. But since, you know, averages and all that kind of stuff span works out, or the, the sweep works out. So basically, if you take it at the center length point, you get the average area. Cool, Agent B7. I'm glad I can help. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be also putting this on YouTube so it doesn't get lost. Um, so x -plane under it basically does it in chunks. Now, why does it do it in chunks? It's because airfoils, if you see over here, the way we define them in x -plane, um, X-Plane allows you to define two airfoils. Um, ignore the two lines here. Really, those are not being used anymore. Um, they are the, the way nowadays you do it with modern airfoils in X-Plane 11 and later. Actually, I think it wasn't like X-Plane 1050 was already, had already this feature in. Um, you, d you can define a different airfoil for the root of the wing so here near the where it anchors to the aircraft and the tip of the wing or be sort of at the extreme edge. Now this wing here on the Challenger is actually composed of two wings stacked together. So there's a root over here, a tip over here, and the root of another wing and the tip of another wing here. So wing one and two. So there, wing one is over here, this piece. Wing two is the outboard piece. And X-Plane then, um, since it knows, okay, I have an airfoil here at the root and a different airfoil at the, at the tip, it does an interpolation. It basically takes, it, it knows there's basically like two different graphs and it basically interpolates between the values depending on how far along the wing that you are. Now there's another piece there that lets you sort of, with you know, the span interpolation power, basically whether at 1.0 it's completely linear interpolation, at greater than one it would be more of the root first than the, 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 the tip airfoil is going to take effect later and the inverse would be for anything less than 1.0. Cool. Um, 
So with that sort of basic set of definitions out the way, now this is pretty straightforward stuff. It shouldn't really be all that difficult to understand. Now, how do we actually define these? And here comes the tricky part. Oh, one more thing. Um, the as I said, we are no longer using the the mechanism here for the two lines, the low RE and high RE. That is not really important anymore. Um, X plane nowadays supports um, defining multiple points for the Reynolds number. Now, what's the Reynolds number? Uh, Reynolds number is a number in fluid dynamics that defines the exact definition is the ratio of viscous to um, to uh, inviscid forces and basically the higher the Reynolds number the greater the tendency of the fluid to flow nice and even called it's called laminar flow um, and I'm going to show you what laminar flow Um, it's, yeah, to a degree, um, laminar flow versus turbulent flow, the higher the Reynolds number, the more of a tendency for the fluid to, uh, flow like this, the, the, the A portion here, so nice and straight lines all parallel to each other, versus the lower the Reynolds number, the greater the tendency for, for the fluid to sort of start coiling up and generating sort of eddies and, and turbulent, turbulence. There's another way to do it. So... Um, in practical terms for airfoils, you don't even need to think of this. Um, Reynolds number for an airfoil, what it means is effectively the, 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 the length of the airfoil times the airspeed. Um, so let's go to Reynolds number calculator. And the equation actually is pretty straightforward. You just multiply a bunch of numbers together. Here you go. That's the way to calculate a Reynolds number manually if you wanted to. Uh, it's VL over nu. Um, kinematic viscosity of the fluid is basically a constant at, for air. Here, here are the kinematic, kinematic viscosities of the air. By default, the calculator here used 10 degree air. And then you basically have to multiply two numbers together. Velocity of the air times the length of the airfoil. So... Say, for instance, our airfoil is, is 1 meter long, and it is flying along at 50 meters per second. At that, in our Reynolds number, and this is a dimensionless number, by the way, it's, it's, there's no units here, it's 3.5 million. So right now we have a graph for the airfoil defined. So here we have the behavior of the airfoil at... Reynolds four and a half million. So let's say we want to define it at 3.5 million. We'll create an entry here for 3.5 million. Then we'll set up the airfoil parameters and blah, 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 blah. And then we can, you know, let's say we also have data for how the airfoil behaves at 100 meters per second. 7 million. So we'll just put this up to 7 million. Now this tells X-Plane when it reads this airfoil file. I have two entries here, one for three and a half mil. And 147, sometimes they're called meg. So 3.5 meg, 147 meg, and um, and uh, we can define a different set of parameters. So right now I have both sets of parameters the same. So let's say, by the way, what these do, this set of parameters here is just for an automated, uh, uh, explain automatically generates um, the graph here for um, for the sort of curves, right? So this is basically a computed value. Um, and, and these are generated using uh, a little equation inside of X-Plane to generate um, shapes or curves, I guess. So let's say uh, I'm going to delete this uh, RE and I'm, we're just going to use a 3.5 meg. Let's say that we know that our wing as a maximum uh, maximum lift, so here's maximum, right? You hold this down, it's gonna tell you blah, blah. But let's say our maximum coefficient of lift is 1.7. So if we look over here right now, this is at 1.7. And also we need to tell it at what 
angle of attack is this maximum lift achieved? Uh, blah, 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 slope, linear range. No, we want to go to uh, CD Alpha 10, Buck CL. There we go, Alpha Max. So this tells us where that maximum lift point is on the positive side. Here we tell it where it is on the minimum side. So let's say that our maximum coefficient of lift is over in at 13 degrees of alpha and minimum coefficient of lift will be, I don't know, somewhere around minus 14, something like that. You'll see that there's an ang a nasty sort of jump over here. Um, what X-Plane basically or the airfoil maker does, you have to understand this is airfoil maker generating a curve for us. It doesn't mean necessarily that the curve is correct. You have to tell it how to set up the curve to match your airfoil data that you have. And I'm going to show you, by the way, how to obtain airfoil data for even airfoils that you only have the shape of. Now, getting the airfoil data usually involves wind tunnel testing and sort of expensive procedures, but there's a way we can simulate an airfoil we, which we don't have data for. So there's a bunch of other parameters here that basically define the shape of the, the curve. We can play around with them. We can play around with, you know, lift power, for example, changes the last sort of uh, x -plane. So Airfoil Maker basically has a linear section here, and it has an X, a, a, a hyperbolic, I guess, section or something like that. That then intercepts the sort of max point, and it has a drop point here, and then some sort of a tail off at the end. So what we can, uh, can uh, what did I mess around here with? Um, right, so let's say we wanted to generate some sort of a smooth intercept. It would look something like this, maybe a little bit more. And then, hey, we thought about making a helicopter. Uh, not really, no, I, I'm terrible at hel helicopters and uh, they're not really all that interesting for me to be honest. I, I like to fly them, but I, I, I can't really make them. Stall drop just tells X, the airfoil maker that we want, for example, some airfoils have a pretty nasty drop of um, lift um, at the sort of maximum alpha point and then they just sort of tail off. Now, there's other parameters in here that tells, for example, a um, What's the uh, what's the sort of shape of the coefficient of drag curve? And there's a reason, by the way, why I'm sort of going over this really quick because I don't really want you to use these controls very much. I'm going to show you how to do this in a much better way. Um, let's see. Um, so you can basically tell, if you just want to estimate some sort of a quick airfoil, you have the data for it, and you just want to punch it quickly into Airfoil Maker without having to worry too much, then yeah, you, 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 can, you can just type in the parameters, I've explained what they are, and uh, yeah, you basically you're just trying to, you take the graph data that you have for the airfoil, and you're just trying to punch the data in to sort of look like what the data is that you have for it. I'm going to show you a much better way to do this. Uh, Airfoil Maker is not a fluid analysis tool. It literally is just a graph generator. Um, well, we do have fluid analysis tools. Here's one. And this one's free. So, if any of you have airfoil, airfoil data, or you have the airfoil shape, but you're not sure about how the how to get the data into, um, you, you either don't have the data for it, or you don't are not sure how to get good data into into airfoil format for X-Plane, get yourself this tool. Um, you can find it in downloads, whatever, and we're gonna fire it up. Here it is. This is basically a graphical front end to a tool called XFOIL. And XFOIL is a command line tool, a subsonic airfoil simulator. 
And this is actually a kind of fluid dynamic analysis um, tool. So you give it the shape of an airfoil and it is going to predict what the airfoil is going to behave like. And this is used by a lot of people to design like model wing airfoils and that kind of stuff. And it's going to give us a reasonably good approximation of what the wing is should, should behave like. So we'll start a new project here. The first thing we'll do, is we're going to go into direct foil design. Here we design the airfoil that we're going to be simulating. Now the trick is, we need the shape, the shape of the airfoil. Um, and let's say that we have an airfoil that is fairly well understood, that you know the um, that you know the shape of. Uh, let's say, let's see, um, what's the Cessna 172 airfoil? It's like NACA 2012 or something like that. 2412. There we go. Um, so say for instance we have a known airfoil. No, it doesn't do transonic. No, CPHL. It sort of taps out at the subsonic regime somewhere about Mach 0.5. So if you want to do supersonic airfoil design, this is probably not for you, but um, what this X-Plane 1140 does now, what? So we have a known airfoil here. I can go into airfoils tools here and we'll type in NACA 2412. Uh, hang on. Airfoil search. It could be, um, but uh, 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 actually, do they have NACA foils here? 24. 12, uh, 2412 is actually a generated one, but who cares? Um, it could be. Um, not really all that important for me, for my purposes, which uh, most civilian aircraft are fairly subsonic. Very few of them go into mild transonic regimes. Anyway, um, you have to understand, when we're generating this data, we're not really going for, you know, within a fraction of a percent of the real thing. There's always going to be at least expect five to ten percent of variance for whatever data we generate, and the rest of it is literally you're going to be hand tuning the model. You fly it in X plane, you test. Okay, what's the maximum speeds I'm getting? What are the sort of lift angles that I'm getting? I mean, you're going to have to fiddle around with the numbers a little bit until it be until it flies right. Or anything that we give that I give you here is just to get you started to the initial ninety percent, and then the remaining ten percent is just hand tuning. Um, okay, so the airfoil, uh, the airfoil for the 172 is NACA 2412. Um, they call modified NACA 2412, but 2412 will, will do for us. NACA 2412 is a standardized airfoil generated, uh, and the 2412 here has a meaning in the NACA database. But as it so happens in uh, airfoil, I'm sorry, in XFLR5, we can just go foil NACA foil. And we'll just put in the number 20, 2412. And number of panel, you can already see it's given us a preview here. Um, number of panels, what that does is it gives you the number of sort of de defined points because it basically builds the airfoil out of pieces. So if I put in like 10, only uses very few. If I put in 100, uses more. I think the maximum is like 150 or something like that. So the, the uh, airfoil simulator uses. A set number of panels. Okay, we'll generate you. We'll call you NACA 2412. Now we have a NACA airfoil here. I'm going to change its color. It's a little bit easier to see on stream. Cool, so that's our airfoil. And how to get this shape is oftentimes a little bit difficult to, to directly get a foil shape. You can look at technical reports. Um, you're going to have to use a lot of Googling if you have an airplane that has a fairly strange airfoil. Um, and then what you can do, there's a way to set a background image here. And you can then use this tool here to estimate the shape of the wing. And you'll try and follow it as closely as you can. 
and once you're happy with it then you'll go ahead and uh, blah 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 foil there was a way to spline right store splines as a foil and this will basically store the shape that you have generated how to get the shape yep that's one way to do it I guess if you have fairly detailed photos of the aircraft if somebody is willing to put the camera right sort of at a good angle um, let's say like 30 degrees above the root of the wing or tip of the wing and take a picture then you might be able to derotate it by 30 degrees basically do a, a, a slight squash or extend at the vertical axis and you might actually be able to hand trace the wing shape yourself but with that in hand, you didn't are able to generate an, an airfoil shape. And yeah, that's that's some that's one way to do it. Um, another way to do it is find a technical report, which is what I did, for example, for the Challenger. Um, Challenger uses pri pretty proprietary airfoils, uh, so they're not really readily available. But there was a technical report from a crash that had the wing shape in it. So I just grab that, traced it out. You go into, you know, store spline as a foil, foil 101, save, and now we have our little foil here. And we can mess around with it. Let's go, actually, we could. How many points do we have on the thing? 157. Okay, that's plenty. 150 panels on the foil here. And you can actually see that it's sort of made out of little straight pieces. That's one way to do it. Now that we've generated the shape of the shape of the foil, I'll just use the NACA foil here because that one is actually not terrible, unlike what I've generated here. Although this would probably fly. Not very well, but it would fly. Uh, we have a, a bunch of parameters, this this thing that this this thing tells us. This tells us maximum the thickness of the airfoil. So let's look at this thing over here. Thickness of the airfoil is the the ratio of the length over here versus the cord length. So we have maximum thickness for for our generated foil is 11.91% of the length, and that maximum thickness occurs at 27.03% of the cord line. So you know somewhere around here ish. And it tells us the camber displacement, basically how um, sort of curved the wing is, and what, at which point the maximum camber line occurs. Uh, for example, for the NACA airfoil, you can see that it has 2% displacement above the direct core line. That's the maximum sort of angle of the camber line because that one follows through the thickness of the wing. And it occurs at 39.94% of the core length. Whereas ours, our wing here, you can see that camber is 0.55%, so it's much more symmetrical. It's not quite as sort of displaced above the cord length, and uh, it occurs actually a little bit earlier, that maximum, the maximum displacement. And you can have completely symmetrical, um, you can have completely symmetrical airfoils. So for example, we'll generate another NACA airfoil, and any one of the, um, by the way, on the NACA airfoils, um, these numbers mean something. 12 is thickness, 12%, and 24 is the 2% uh, camber displacement, and the 4 I forget. So if we just use 0, 0 here, that will generate a symmetrical airfoil. Completely symmetrical. NACA 0, 12. And we want to change the color. Actually, I'm happy with it. No, this was our 2012. Well, so I want to switch you around. I want to show that one, and I want to switch the color here because it picks the wrong colors. So you can see here that the wing is completely symmetrical. Camber is 0%, so there's absolutely no vertical displacement of the camber line. Cool. And this wing, by the way, this airfoil would have completely symmetrical behavior. It would lift um, in either direction completely, the, the graph would be entirely symmetrical that we'll generate. So, let's have a look at NACA 2412. We've generated the shape, now we want to figure out how it behaves. 
So we'll go into X, X foil direct analysis. That means that when we want to take direct analysis means we'll go from shape to behavior. Inverse analysis would be if we have behavioral graphs and we want to go back to the shape. We want to generate the shape that approximates a an airfoil behavior. Because oftentimes when you're doing model airplane design, this is primarily meant for model airplanes. Um, when you're going to inverse design, what you're telling it basically, okay, I want to have um, I want to have a lift coefficient of lift to something and a coefficient of drag of something. Tell me what shape of wing do I got to make to get that. Whereas for direct design, direct analysis, what we're doing is we're taking the shape that we already have. We'll select NACA 2412 here, and I want to figure out a given a shape of a wing. How is it going to fly? So we'll go into analysis here. I'm going to define an analysis. And so here's a, a one of the ways to do this. You could literally just type in here the Reynolds number you want to analyze, and the Reynolds number you'll get from here. So say for instance, the length of the wing is one meter, and we want to simulate how it behaves at 50 meters per second. So that's about 100 knots. Three and a half meg, so we'll type in 3.5 million. Ah, come on. 3.5 million. We can put in a mock correction. Um, doesn't really make much of a difference, but for, for now, yeah, sure. Let's put in mock point one. That's not really going to do very much, so let's leave mock corrections at zero. And crit, uh, all of this location here are, these are parameters that are fairly deep into the analysis routine and what they mean. So we're going to, we're going to just leave that alone for now. Okay. We'll save that. Now you can see that we've defined a new window in here. So we have a set of graphs now ready to be generated for a Reynolds number of 3.5 meg, mock zero correction and crit 9.0. We'll just leave in crit 9.0. You can just leave there. Just don't touch it. It's, it's a very, very, very specific parameters that you're not really going to be messing around with. And for analysis settings, we have prepared these sort of general parameters in the analysis. And now what we're going to do is we're going to sweep the wing through a range of um, angles of attack. So we'll make an alpha sequence. So at a certain, we're going to change the angle of attack from minus 25, that'll be like that, down, to plus 25, up in increments of 0 0.1 degrees and initialize boundary layers just uh, you can just leave that checked that means that the uh, analysis tool is going to basically uh, reinitialize itself uh, when it when it restarts viscous analysis yes we do want to do viscous analysis because that is for that's going to give us basically things like when the stall point is going to occur because uh, um, the viscous transitions are when basically you get from Nice laminar flow, turbulent flow, that's your stall. And store off points, yes, we do want that. That'll store the sort of uh, pressure points along the wing. And you'll see what that looks like here in just a second. So, go ahead and start the analysis, and it's going to take a little while to complete. So, at minus unconverged means that the uh, analysis tool was not able to, uh, to generate points, because... The way that the analyzer works is it basically takes the previous estimate and it hopes to get some sort of a reasonable answer. The, the, it, the process is not, not entirely um, algorithm, sort of not entirely analytical. It basically tries a set of parameters and until it gets an answer that it thinks is reasonable, it then retries it for a number of times and makes sure that the solution for the, you know, what sort of flow patterns exist around the wing are going to are basically converging down to a known answer. So we're gonna to help it basically along. We'll give it a starting point of zero angle of attack. So we're just gonna strike straight on with the, on the wing. We know that that is very likely to converge, and we'll sweep the wing just up, and then we'll start again from zero and sweep the wing just down, and we'll see when it stops uh, being able to converge a reasonable solution. So we'll go ahead and hit analyze, and you can see that. Sometimes at some points it doesn't really converge. That's just the numerical model not being able to do a solution. Cool. So we've been able to converge most of the points up to 25 degrees of alpha at 3.5 meg. And we'll also do a negative one. So let's do that.
Cool. And it's basically about negative 20 is about the limit. Oh, there we go. There was some convergence at 25. So what do these graphs mean? And if you look at what Airfoil Maker had in here, these might seem actually somewhat familiar. Let's go back to XFLR5. You'll notice, uh, I didn't want to do, uh, where's the graph? I want to show all graphs. Notice A was all, yep, that's the one. There we go. So this is our coefficient of lift graph. And it might look familiar. So this is the behavior of the airfoil at Reynolds number 3.5 meg. So, and by the way, keep in mind, Reynolds number at 3.5 meg, we're looking at an airfoil that flies, is one meter long at a speed of 50 meters per second. To get the same Reynolds number for an airfoil that is half a meter long, let's say we'd have to fly at twice the speed. So that'd be 200 knots approximately. So do keep this in mind for the sort of wing that you're designing. And by the way, X-Plane does calculate this number for each piece of the wing separately. So it knows, you know, the wing is this long here and it flies at this speed. So therefore it has Reynolds number something. And it then uses that to look up in, this, in the graphs here, look at the proper behavior. So you can see that, for example, our wing here achieves a maximum coefficient of lift of 1.8 approximately at an alpha of x uh, at an alpha of uh, approximately 19 degrees 18.7 something and at an alpha of 0 we have a coefficient of lift of roughly 0 0.25 so actually funny enough airfoil maker here made a wing for us that is roughly a NACA 2412 wing but you don't have to now go go ahead and you know try and, and mess around with these to match the numbers that you see here. I'm going to show you a way to get this exact graph one to one directly into Airfoil Maker because I've made a little tool that does that that directly takes this graph and shoves it in here. So then you don't have to mess with any of these parameters. Pretty neat, eh? Okay, um, so we're going to go back to all graphs. We have other graphs here that we can see. So here we have um, the coefficient of lift versus the coefficient of drag. And again, if we check this out like that, that's that purple line here. So we have generated something fairly similar, but this is actually based on a fluid dynamic simulation, whereas this is just some sort of gen the result of a couple of generated curves that just airfoil maker literally just uses a bunch of trivial equations to generate a, a curve. That's really all that it does. So let's say that you want to get you want to get a little bit more wild with this and you want to simulate the wing at a, multi, a multitude of points. Um, by the way, you can jump in here. Um, these are what they call the pressure curves. Um, we'll ignore that for now. You can do a, a bunch of really neat things. You can sort of shift this over here and we can show um, CP graph nope not the CP graph we want to go turn polar I oh, don't know it's over here we can show the pressure points <laughs> cool Sammy you can show the pressure points of the wing and this what this tells you is what is the sort of behavior of uh, at each along each of these little straight panels that we've simulated? What is the total force? So, for instance, you'll see that the wing is actually being pulled down over here at the bottom, and it's being pulled up over on the top side. Now, these really are pressure differential numbers, but who cares? You know, ultimately, it's basically a force. And when you sum up all of these forces around here. It's going to give you that. It's going to tell you that okay, the wing has a net positive force up over here, and its point and its center point is over here. So if we look at where the 25% chord point would be, that tells us that the wing wants to twist down. And we can actually see that coefficient of moment is negative, 0.053. Coefficient of lift is positive, and we have a little bit of drag. And you can do even funnier things. You can actually 
It's the new version of XFLR5. Doesn't really want me to. You can do funny things like these. You can watch as the pressure points evolve on the wing uh, with you with the twist that it's going through during um, changes in angle of attack. Pretty neat, eh? But here you can see the funny part is that at very high angles of attack just before the stall point, which is about here, the maximum lift of the wing is actually being generated at the front of it, right here, near the nose, just at the leading edge. The trailing edge largely does not contribute. And you can even do, uh, it actually lets you animate it. Huh, there we go, it's actually even funnier. We don't have to do it by, by hand. Cool. That's the animation thing. Uh, another thing is you can show, it's called the boundary layer. Um, so this is basically what the boundary layer of the air looks like around the wing. And you can see that it stays very nicely attached. The, 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 the boundary layer splits at the top, at the leading edge here, to a, a layer that goes above the wing, one that goes below the wing. And you'll see that as we get up to, to higher angles of attack, you'll see the leading, uh, the, the, the upper boundary layer starts to separate. And when we get to the stall point, there we go, that's about stall. As you can see that there's a lot of separation for the boundary layer. So the boundary layer is your nice laminar flow section. That's where the flow is nice and straight, all parallel lines. Whereas, as soon as it separates out, this section right here now, that's your turbulent layer. Uh, so this is, this is where you would feel the sort of aerodynamics, sort of the shutter uh, when you have, when you're approaching a stall point. And the more it separates, the higher, the, the more sort of aerodynamic buffet that you would feel. That's why when you get to, uh, yeah, uh, Aster, I agree. Um, so that's why, for example, you can fly at 10 degrees alpha and not feel any buffet because there's, there's very little of the sort of separated turbulent layer on the wing. But the further you increase alpha, as you get closer to the stall point, you can see that, that actually it's, it's not a sort of binary, you know, I have aerodynamic uh, uh, buffet and I, or I don't have. It actually is gradual. It starts to slowly build the higher the alpha gets. And it basically becomes annoying at some point. And that's basically what's warning you that, hey, you're approaching stall because this region here at the back is starting to separate. Now you'll also get negative alpha stall. So when we get down here, we will at some point, there you can see, the wing will separate even at negative alphas. And it happens for this wing actually kind of at a, at, at a similar point. So there, the, the wing is still pretty symmetrical in, in stalling behavior. Now, negative alpha is very unlikely to happen in a civilian aircraft, but for military aircraft, yeah, they fly at pretty extreme alphas. Cool. So now we have the craft generated for 3.5 meg. What if we want to define it for more than one set of points here, right? So we want to define, because this only tells us the wind behavior, and I go, this is, these are the two buttons that toggle between graphs. A to show all the graphs, one to show the first graph, one, two, three, four, five. So one, two, three, four, five. Just some, what I'm pressing on my keyboard here. Now you can actually show, these are called polar graphs. Um, this is called a polar graph for this airfoil at this parameter set. So 3.5 meg, zero Mach correction, and crit nine. What we can do is we can generate multiple polars. So we'll do, we'll say instead of defined analysis, we'll do batch, ana batch analysis. And we'll select the airfoils here. We'll just analyze one airfoil. You can actually provide a set of airfoils that you want to generate. But no, we want to only act, analyze NACA 2412. 
Type one analysis means viscous analysis. That's the uh, that's the one with the stall point. And we'll put in a number of we can either put in a range of Reynolds numbers, say for instance, we want to analyze from one meg up to 10 meg in one million Reynolds number increments. We are not going to use any mock corrections for now. And uh, we won't force a transition point. We'll go from alpha negative 20 up to alpha, up to alpha oh, let's say negative, tw yeah, negative 20 is cool, good enough. And we'll say from zero, that means the analyzer is going to start from zero alpha, go to plus 25. Why did I put negative in here? Go to plus 25, then from zero to negative 25. In max iterations, we can leave it 100. Uh, that's basically the number of tries that the analyzer is going to do to try and converge the airfoil solution. So what this is going to generate, it's going to generate graphs for 1 million, 2 million, 3 million, and so on, up to 10 million, 1E07. In it, so going to go in increments of 1 million Reynolds from alpha minus 20 to plus 25 in alpha increments of 0.1 degrees. And we'll just uh, initialize boundary layer after each polar calculation. Yeah. Yeah. We can just check this. This basically reinitializes the analyzer from zero, basically from scratch, um, when, when it basically restarts a new polar analysis. Cool. Run the analysis. And this is going to take quite a while to complete. Um, it's going to take several minutes. So right now it's doing the 1 million analysis up to alpha plus 25. You can see that right at this low Reynolds number, it doesn't really want to... basically is way past the stall point and it cannot find a valid solution at alpha of... at an alpha of above like 20, more than 20. So now we're doing Reynolds number 2 million. And if you look, um, you know, your CPU is going to be... It's using 100% of one core. It's a single-threaded process right now. There is a, there is a multi-threaded batch analysis version. Um, I've not found that one to be very reliable, so uh, I s instead just stick it to one core is usually good enough and uh, you avoid having like multi-threading issues because this software, the, the, the software that this is based on, Xpoil, was written originally in Fortran and it shows uh, because it was basically written in like the 70s and uh, people didn't really care about things like having clean variable design and then sort of that kind of stuff didn't really work that good. Hey Mr. Chu, how are you doing? Yeah, so in the 70s, Steve, um, actually there's a paper for Expo from like 1986 or something like that where they were testing it on various CPUs for them to analyze um, like doing a single sweep of alphas at, uh, you know, half a degree increments. So much less dense than we are doing with like 20, 20 iterations max. Then for them, it took like 10 minutes to do a single sweep for us, you know, there we go. Analysis complete. Now we have, and actually I'm going to go ahead and delete our 3.5 meg analysis here because it's kind of not really fitting into our neat little graph. So we're going to go right click, current polar graph, delete. Yes, we're going to delete the 3.5 meg analysis. And there we go. Uh, Mr. Chu, I haven't really looked at explain 1140 and it's not going to do much here. So interesting results, as you might, might have guessed. Interesting results it for primarily for the reason that we can see that this is basically the 1.1 1 meg. Hey, Torb Torbinator, how are you doing? Um, here we have the one meg result. Mr. Chu, I know what you mean, but I haven't just had time to look at Explain 1140's flight model changes. Um, most of them seem reasonable, um, but they are generally, I'd say, rather meh, you know, trivial in the sort of big picture mode, not obviously in the small detailed mode. 
So we have the, the bottom analysis here. So we'll go ahead and select the one meg polar. We can actually even edit if we wanted to, we can edit each data point. Uh, but you know, it's just not practical to be editing each one of these. Um, you can see that the max, the, the stall point for a 1 million Reynolds number airfoil occurs at approximately, uh, where are we? About 16 degrees of alpha. Whereas for the 10 million Reynolds, it occurs at 20.5 million alpha. So there's the sort of, uh, you know, the naive explanation that we give to children that, you know, it doesn't really matter what sort of the angle of attack is. Um, it, 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 I'm sorry, it doesn't matter what the airspeed is. Um, the wing should stall at a given angle of attack. Well, since I've just showed you that, let's say we have a wing here at um, 40 meters per second, or let's say 30 meters per second, so that would be about 60 knots. The angle of attack, uh, the, the stalling angle of attack changes quite significantly with airspeed. This would be about, you know, 110 knots versus 60 knots. Um, it's not only that the the airspeed is different at which you would, or no, the airspeed was not changed, but it's the angle of attack at which the wing was, was, was going to transition from the sort of nice laminar flow to a viscous flow is quite different depending on airspeed. So it's not quite so true that airspeed has no effect on stall speeds. It, to a degree, it does. Or stall angle of attack. And to a degree, it does. Not too much. And also, you got to keep in mind. For example, if we had a one meter wing, one meter long, so that's be that'd be something like a Cessna 172. Um, to get to um, so 60 meters per second, that's about 120 knots. That's four million over here. That'd be like um, that'd be that'd be like. Uh, the graph here that you can see you know, highlighted to get from here to the 10 million graph um, you'd have to be flying at probably 200 knots well, way faster than 200 knots um, I'm sorry 140 meters per second there we go so it, you'd have to be flying at approximately 145 meters per second that's about 300 knots just under 300 knots, 280 knots um, true airspeed at sea level in a 172. Would you be able to pull 20 degrees of alpha? Probably not. You would, first of all, be, ha be lucky to consider the airplane to be sufficiently um, together to hold, hold, hold together in one piece, not to mention the, the G-forces on the wing would be just so excessive from the giant amounts of lift that you would be generating versus, you know, your 60 knots for a stall that you'd probably rip the wings off before, way before you got to 20 degrees of alpha angle of attack. For a fighter jet, sure, you would be able to pull 20 degrees of alpha, no issues, but for a, for a civilian aircraft, probably not. Certainly not for high airspeeds. Up to 10 degrees is about reasonable what you could expect for a civilian aircraft to be pulling on the angle of attack. So that's Coefficient of the lift. There's a different kind of description. This is called the CL over CD graph. I'm sorry, the C CL versus CD graph. Um, this is usually used by airflow designers because it sort of shows some other interesting portions. Like you can easily guess where the sort of center point is for zero alpha, um, and the sort of typical performance graph for guessing where the wing is most efficient is you can just look at the maximum point here on this graph. Is your CL over CD versus alpha graph. Coefficient of moment. This is a graph that's kind of important for determining behavior of the wing. Usually wings become unstable when they are in positive CM, where the CM graph, if I show you here on Airfoil Maker, you can see the yellow line here goes positive at about negative 15 degrees of alpha, but for all the other alphas, it's 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 negative. I'm sorry, it goes positive below negative 15. But it usually stays negative, so that means the wing has a tendency to want to twist down to lower angles of attack. Yeah, so fighter pilots have to pay a lot of attention to angle of attack because it's it's not just because their wings are capable of it. Um, it's more to do with the fact that um, that. 
when you get into very high angles of attack. And I can show you here on X-Plane, uh, on the air, on Airfoil Maker, you can get into some very high drag, and especially over here, into some very strange behaviors where the wing wants to sort of um, depart the aircraft from controlled flight. So when you are at very high angles of, of attack, you, the aircraft can depart from controlled flight quite readily, and then you have a problem, especially if that is your... Um, you're in a dogfight or something. You don't want to. You don't want to have the aircraft out of control. <clears throat> Transition point for um, pressures that really does not affect us. So we want to grab this. We're gonna grab this. We actually can even uh, current graph. Um, on graph settings and we can go ahead and select x-axis y-axis so say for instance this is our cd graph coefficient of drag yeah well flight by wire is entirely de designed around the point the idea that a computer can put in much faster inputs and much more specific inputs than a human could um, yeah, so fly-by-wire could mitigate that, but that is sort of besides the point, that is separate from the point of discussing about um, airfoil design. So, how do we get this data into X-Plane, or into Airfoil, airfoil Maker? And to do that, let's say, I'll go into Airfoil Maker here. First, what we want to do is we want to set up separate tabs for the Reynolds numbers that we want to import. We can pretty much ignore everything here in that plus or minus 20 degree region. And we'll create a new higher RE tab, higher RE. I think there's like a limit of like five of them or something. Uh, I keep forgetting. Airfoil Maker has a limited number of Reynolds numbers that you can define, at least it used to. There we go. Yeah, 10 of them is the limit. So that you can at most define 10 Reynolds numbers uh, graphs and x will select which one to use based on the current Reynolds number of the current piece of the wing. Hey Gustav, how are you doing? Next, what we're going to do is we we'll want to save this thing. So we'll save this as, I don't know, we'll just save it somewhere in airfoils. You, could, you, you would normally save that under your aircraft. We'll save it into airfoils and we'll just name it, you know, um, our experiment, experiment, AFL, save airfoil. With that, we'll go into XFLR5, we'll select each one of these Reynolds numbers, and we can actually save our project here, um, and I'll save that, I don't know, I'll just stick it over into temp for me. My experiment. That'll save the entire airfoil project file, so you can get you can reopen this back in XFLR5 and mess around with it some more. So we'll go ahead and for all the polars, export all to text format. And we'll save them into, I don't know, call polar open. This should generate show you what it looks like in here temp polar so it's generated a bunch of files here in text format we want to have those in the in in this exact text format uh, there's a reason why i chose the export here into text format not plr hey real to same how are you doing so now what these are is tabulated data from xfoil for the individual angles of attack. We have one at Reynolds 2 meg, 3 meg, 4 meg, and so on and so forth, right? Now, I'm gonna show you a neat little trick. Airfoils, there's our experimental airfoil. There it is. If I open this up in a text editor, you'll notice that the airfoil data for X-Plane is also a tabulated format and it contains three or four columns alpha coefficient of lift coefficient of drag coefficient of moment and then we 
If we look down over here, for example, you know, alpha negative four has this lift, this drag, this moment, blah, blah, blah. So really what X-Foil, I'm sorry, what Airfoil Maker does is it just generates the points here and stores them in a file. And actually close down Airfoil Maker for now. And if you look at what the polar data is, it's essentially the same thing, alpha, lift, drag, moment. And there's a bunch of other parameters that are generated from the airfoil analysis. So wouldn't it be nice if we could splice the two together? And that's exactly what I've created a tool for. It's uh, available on GitHub, but it is a command line only tool. And I don't think I make a Windows, I can make a Windows build um, if people are interested. Uh, it's called uh, Polar to AFL. It takes polar data and blah, blah, blah. There we go. Compiles. And what you tell it is you tell it, what was that SH? Oh, it was symmetrical airfoil, so it doesn't really matter for us. So you'll tell it an input airfoil format file. Hey, hello, how are you doing? Uh, you'll give it an input uh, airfoil uh format file from xplane so we'll go to xplane 11 that's where i have my install aircraft i'm sorry not airfoil ex airfoils experiment make this a little bit larger so you can see a little bit better so we'll give it the input airfoil we'll give it some output airfoil name uh, airfoil airfoils experiment out yeah don't worry I'll, I'll make them one okay so and now it also wants the polar txt file so it wants the list of these files in here so we'll give it the path to that and it's in temp polar and we'll just go asterisk everything just take all the polar files and integrate them and what this tool does is it um, opens up the <coughs> the airfoil file here it reads this graph for each of the Reynolds numbers that is defined so for example here we have one defined for Reynolds number one meg and we have another one defined for Reynolds number two meg and it takes all the ma all matching polar files that it has so this one is for calculated for Reynolds number one million and it splices the two together replacing any sections in the X-Plane airfoil file with polar data that we've generated from XFLR5. Hit enter. Now, we'll rerun Airfoil Maker. Actually, I'm going to fire up two instances of it so you can see. So here's our original airfoil, experiment AFL. And then we'll grab the new one. airfoils experiment out and there we go that's the airfoil data from xflr5 shoved into an x-plane afl file you can see that it's no longer that sort of smooth down curve it's actually the output data generated directly from from uh, airfoil maker i'm sorry from xflr5 and it since um this graph only goes to plus or minus 20. We can also look at the plus or minus 180. Now, normally, if I just stopped wherever the data from uh, XFLR5 ended, you would see a jump here. So what I've done is I've taken um, an extra, I think, like plus or 10, plus five or 10 degrees extra alpha, and bl they blend are blended together for, for the X-plane behavior, for the X-plane curves. So if you really, really wanted to, you could first set up the airfoil file here. By the way, don't touch any of these buttons anymore because they will regenerate the graph. So if I touched anything now, it will regenerate the RE file for that one thing. So be careful about no longer be being able to use those controls. So what you could do if you really wanted to go crazy is you could, for each of these Reynolds, first set up a rough curve to get the sort of beyond 180 degree behavior and then uh, you could you'll splice in the data from XFLR5 for the main region for the plus or minus 20, 25, 30 degrees, however much, 
however many degrees you want to generate in XFLR5. Really, you could do more if you wanted to. You could do, um, I don't know, you could go to plus 35. So we could go from here to there at 10 meg. Initialize boundary layers, sure. And we could gen generate a graph, graph that goes much further. But keep in mind, the convergence of the system much beyond the stall point is going to be rather questionable. So although XFLR5 is going to try you're probably not likely to succeed much beyond much beyond the stall point. So we're probably done over here. And yeah, so we could generate for this guy, we could generate for Reynolds 10 meg, we could generate a little bit past 30 meg. And keep in mind, this is going to actually pull back. So at lower Reynolds numbers is not going to be able to pull to generate quite as much data. So let's say at Reynolds 5 meg, if we, we could actually run uh, batch analysis uh, from, I don't know, from 3 meg. Oh, no, it's not going to define new analyses. I'm just going to manually run these by hand, sort of up to, let's say, 30 degrees. And you'll see that actually the lower the Reynolds number is actually not going to be able to reach quite as high an alpha because the... Uh, X-Foil's numerical model kind of gets unstable when, when it gets very much into turbulent flow. So Reynolds 9 meg was only able to get up to just the low 30, 30 degrees of alpha. And these are going to be very, very much dependent on the exact airfoil that you're trying to simulate. Um, yeah, this one's not going to converge much beyond 20 something degrees. So yeah, and if you want, and then you can actually regenerate, um, re-export these out. So we'll go ahead and shove them in here, and we can regenerate the airfoil for airfoil maker. So just gonna pick up my terminal here, rerun the same command, and reopen the airfoil in airfoil maker. So now we should get somewhat more defined behavior for the high alpha values over here but yeah they end at about i don't know 30 something degrees that's about where our xflr5 data ends yeah. reopen airfoil maker just to be sure that it's opened the right file yeah there we go so yeah this is how you get accurate airfoil data just based on shape into Airfoil Maker. Now, there's some other features that you might want to be that you might be struggling with um, that do not directly pertain to Airfoil Maker, and that is flap determining flap behavior. So, um, explain. Normally, um, it has a pretty dumb and simple model for flap behavior. And to determine flap behavior, unfortunately, we don't have a separate airfoil we could give it. So we'll go back into direct foil design. And we can actually define a flap uh, at various angles. So we'll go set flap. And we'll say we want to define a trailing edge. We can also define a leading edge flap. That'll be basically like a sl like a slat. And we'll go 10 degrees down, hinge. So that means where along the cord is the hinge located. So is it at you know 50 degrees flap? Is it a, a sort of 75 degree flap point, and so on and so forth? And where is the hinge exactly located? Is it at half thickness? You could put it at like 10% thickness, and basically that would mean that the flap would be twisting down from about here. Or you could put it at the other end. That would mean that the flap hinges somewhere down here, somehow. Um, so yeah, this does not allow you to do Fowler flaps, so flaps that generate a gap. Unfortunately, that's a limitation of X-Foil. Um, not a trivial problem to solve, but you can sort of estimate flap behavior from a plain flap behavior. This will generate a new airfoil for us. So let's say flap plus 10. 
So now we have a second airfoil. We can actually generate multiple of these. So we'll do another flap, one at 20 degrees. We'll call you flap plus 20. And we'll generate one more for flaps at 30 degrees. Sure, whatever. Okay. Hey, the hubinator, how are you doing? Cool. And we'll give, give these some usable color so I can actually see them. Uh, we'll make you blue. And this guy will make red. Cool, so now we have a we, now we have three airfoils representing three different flap settings on the on the wing. We'll go into Xfoil direct analysis. Now all of this data we have here is for right now just a plain NACA airfoil. So we can go current airfoil, show only associated polars. But we only have airfoil, I'm sorry, we only have uh, right now data for one of these so we'll go ahead and run a batch analysis and we won't go quite up to 10 meg let's say we'll go up to 5 million and we'll go from 2 million so from 2, 3, 4 and 5 million Reynolds analysis in 1 meg increments and we'll go a number of airfoils and we'll go generate this, this and this go from alpha negative 20 up to alpha positive 25 I don't know something like that from zero reinitialize battery layers after each polar and let's go that's again gonna take a little bit of time because it's gonna do all the foils in order Again, if you want to experiment with multi-threaded analysis it does have the support for it I don't think it's quite that stable but if you want to check it out go for it and you can actually already see that it is painting new graphs for us here in real time as it populates it with data. So right now it's doing the plus 10 flap. There's at Reynolds 3, so this was 3 meg, 4 meg, I think 5, no, 2, 3, 4, 5. So that's going to be 4 graphs here. It has the 4 meg graph. And it's going to be the 5 meg graph, and then it's going to do flap 20 and flap 30 graph. Again, keep in mind, we're not going for super high accuracy. This is not a computational fluid dynamic simulation with the exact shape of the aircraft or the exact 3D shape of the wing. We're just doing an, a, an airfoil section, and we're just trying to estimate the behavior, roughly what it's going to do. And then we are going to fine tune this in X-Plane. Now here's a problem that I can already see. It's generated a bunch of weird sort of notches here. Um, sometimes the X-Foil simulation is not entirely stable and it generates some weird data. Normally we would probably want to smooth these out and I'm going to show you how to do that, how we can actually get rid of that erroneous, erroneous data there. It's probably not gonna, not gonna do very very good data at flap flap uh, plus thirty degrees. Yeah, this notch here. We'll, we'll, we're gonna we'll get rid of some of these. But really, for the flap thing, we don't really care all that much because X Plane. I'm going to show you essentially what Plane Maker does for flaps, and it's a pretty primitive method. So much for you know, highly accurate, <laughs> highly accurate physics behavior. X Plane sometimes does not really do do things too well. It's having trouble converging in negative four. Yeah, there we go. It's reconverged. Two meg, three meg. Now it's doing the four meg version. 
Usually... Yes, I will, Astro, don't worry. I will put it on YouTube as well so it doesn't get lost in Twitch's memory hole. Cool. So it's just about finishing up. And it's having some trouble at the very high, uh, very high flap settings. Cool. Yeah. There's a bunch of weird data be here. But I can see here that it's generated some strange sort of points here. We'll actually get, we can get rid of those, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so if you look at Airfoil Maker, it does not have a flap section. You, you, there's no way for you to tell it, you know, this data applies when X amount of flaps is in. Here's how that works. Be useful for the to the guy who at, asked you about this, but we haven't seen here yet. Yeah, it could be. Um, so I'm going to show you how to control these graphs, by the way. Um, we can go ahead and for the current, we can actually just tell it, you know, show only the polars for the currently selected airfoil. So if we go like that, that will limit us only to NACA 2412 or the plus 10 version or the plus 30 version that cleans up the graph a little bit now to get rid of the these sort of irregularities if it just annoys you in the graph um, you just go I know that it's the 5 meg graph that is the issue here we'll go into current polar edit data points and we'll find the relevant data points where it sort of swings out of out of, out of whack so I know that it's an alpha about negative 5 um, and there must have been a discont discontinuity. There we go. So here's the sort of big jump. I can see that it's, there's a bunch of points missing. So from minus 7.4 to minus 5.7, and there's a big jump in coefficient of lift. So I know that I'm, I can delete this set of points here because I know that they are invalid. So that's cleaned up the graph a little bit here. That's just for in case it annoys you. I'm going to show only these polars. You can do similar things, sort of get rid of some of these notches. Um, but really what we're looking for here is um, the relative behavior. So for current foil, show associated polars. So I've selected show associated polars instead of show only associated polars. Uh, so now what I can gauge here is the change in the coefficient of lift and the change in coefficient of drag what was where's my drag or there we go it's number five change in coefficient of drag at alpha zero right so i can see that um let's see we can actually make this even a little bit better i'd associated polars uh current polar show associate no no not op, not op points um What was the way to only show the current currently selected polar point? Ba -ba -da -ba -da. Nope. Anyway, we'll, we'll kind of muddle our way through here. Anyway, um, so our five meg polar. So here's the thing. Uh, X plane largely only cares about the delta here, but the change from here to here at roughly the zero alpha point. It's kind of dumb, but that's unfortunately how x works. And um, it's even weirder is we need to derotate the value here a little bit. So one thing that I've always found pretty annoying is if you look in the wings section, not that I want to go into controls, control geometry. Here's where you control flaps and slats and all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, x does not really understand. It, it thinks that the coefficient of lift... Yeah. It thinks that um, coefficient of lift is simply a delta for, for a certain flap. So say, for instance, for a flap that is located, you know, the inboard flap over here. And I can show you what it looks like with 
moving control and that kind of stuff. So there's the sort of inboard flap section. Um, X-Plane thinks that um, the flap generates a certain amount of extra lift as a consequence of two things. Um, and where's my GIMP picture? There we go. Gotta take down the brightness here a little bit. So explain things as I as I told you. Um, explain knows that when I tell it, you know, um, uh, I didn't want to make it a sea of blood. Explain knows that when I have a wing that contains a flap, let's say for instance we have a simple, you know, plain flap that looks something like that. Whatever. Explain knows that here we have the leading edge, trailing edge, and it's going to calculate the it's going to calculate the chord line like that. So now, even if the if the airplane is flying at effectively zero alpha, or you think that it's flying at zero angle of attack, so let's say that the direction of wind is directly parallel, I'm sorry, directly horizontal along this picture, X-Plane is going to think that, oops, we already have a positive angle of attack alpha here. So it's going to shift its lookup along the graph here to the right. So, you basically have to understand that the values being shown here by XFLR5 is literally at, uh, is literally being shown at, uh, current polar, hide associated off points. Now I wanted to select. Uh, poor thing is now sort of spilling its guts. Okay, op point graph. I'm going to hide everything. Hide all op points. There we go. So here's a little trick. Is XFLR5 shows you the um, shows the airfoil or the graph is always indexed like this right so it's always indexed to the zero degree chord line as if it were not due to flap displacement explain adds in the flap displacement when it does the lookup through the graph here automatically um, automatically shifts you over so how do we counter that we counter that by instead of going from you know 0 0.25 to 1. To, you know, instead of putting in something like hey, the extra flap effect, um, there's my, my extra flap effect is not like 0 0.95, it's going to be a little bit less because you got to subtract it not from here, but from where X-Plane would have thought that you were. It's going to be sort of like between here, 0 point something, up to that point. But it's going to be something more like, you know, 0 0.7. And again, this is largely going to depend, and same thing for the drag coefficient. So if you look at the drag graph here, you got to actually shift your view over for the basic non-flapped version over to the right, depending on how much extra alpha would, would have been generated by, by the angle here. You got to do this. This is not super difficult math, but it's going to take a little bit of, you know, calculating some angles here, figuring out, you know, I'm, I'm at this number, this amount of chord length, chord length, extra displacement, so how much extra alpha would X-Plane think that I have? One way to counter that is what I've done for the Challenger, is I've basically told X-Plane, hey, the flap's only displaced by three degrees at most. So that basically means that the chord line is not really going to shift over. I can close this. The chord line, I'm sorry, the, the, the alpha line is not really going to shift over very much. It's basically going to stay pretty close to here. And then I just manually shove into X-Plane, you know, the 
extra lift is something. So yeah. That is some caveat. Um, again, a lot of this you're going to have to basically test by flying. Um, it's going to give you the data here in XFLR5 is going to give you a reasonable stall behavior. You might get to within, you know, 10% of your stall speed, but you're going to have to mess around with it a little bit more by hand manually. There's just no way around that, unfortunately. And there's only so much we can do. Literally, if I could, um, if I could just export these graphs directly into Xfoil, I'm sorry, into, into Airfoil Maker, until I explain, hey, at this flap setting, use this, I would. Yeah, it's the same for slats too. Uh, slats also lower your uh, leading edge. Uh, basically, what they would do is they would sort of droop your leading edge down like that. So X plane would then think, okay, the alpha is now lower. But I haven't really tested that because I have not had a reason to fly or. All the aircraft that I've worked on so far had no slats, but uh, but yeah, there's always just, just some amount of sort of I I guess haggling with the data and trying to get everything to work work out right. But yeah, you can you can derive a lot of information from this, uh, even with these unstable sections here. You can kind of get rid of a lot of them, um, and I'll compile a version of. Uh, Polar to AFL for other people to use if they wanted to. And you'll be able to just take the non flapped version. You'll be able to take uh, all the data from XFLR5 and just directly import it into X Plane, including the um, uh, lift graph, drag graph, and where's my alpha graph, my CM graph. Here's the CM graph. So all of these are going to appear in airfoil maker exactly as they are in uh sure man uh, exactly as they are in xflr5 cool beans and again after importing the data don't touch these controls anymore because they're because they're going to regenerate the graph and break whatever import whatever was imported beans right um, so I'm gonna wrap it up here uh, folks I'll see you next time I wanted to make this a short stream uh, I just wanted to talk about getting this data in there getting uh, XFLR5 uh, polar data ex exported and stuck into X planes airfoil maker and uh, yeah I mean people how to set it up uh, once you're, by the way, once you have data in, in this format, obviously you want to go into expert airfoils and assign them to the respective section. So we could, you know, select our little experimental. Where's our experimental? We have to rescan it. Hang on. <coughs> Here's our experimental airfoil. We could assign that to the aircraft and test it out. Root, tip, and the upper and lower lines here mean nothing anymore since... The Reynolds number is now taken from this set of tabs. Usually you don't have to generate 10 of them. You can generate like four or five. That's plenty close enough. But, you know, have fun. See how far that takes you. What sort of mileage you can get out of it. And I hope to see you next time, folks. Take care. I'm going to see if we can find somebody to send you over to. Um, if there's anybody who's online messing around with stuff not ah, sure so yeah take care love you all and all that good stuff bye 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 folks